Good afternoon. Uh, the speaker I am about to introduce hardly need, needs an introduction. Simon Goldhill is one of the best known classicists of his generation, and he has lectured and broadcast all over the world, including this country, of course. He is professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge and foreign secretary <coughs> and vice president of the British Academy. His books have been translated into 10 languages and won three international prizes in three different subject areas. Their titles speak for themselves. Jerusalem, City of Longing, 2008, Victorian Culture and Classical Antiquity, 2011, <clears throat> Sophocles and the Language of Tragedy, <clears throat> 2012. His most uh, recent books are The Christian Invention of Time and What is a Jewish Classicist, both published in 2022. <coughs> About the most uh, notable volumes he edited are uh, The End of Dialogue in Antiquity, 2009, and especially relevant to the present occasion, Being Greek Under Rome, Cultural Identity, the Second Sophistic, and the Development of Empire. 2007. And today, and he will speak of migratory texts and the topography of late antique religion in Palestine. Simon, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks to Marin for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be back here in Jerusalem um, and uh, to be able to speak to you. Well, whether you see yourself on the yellow brick road with Dorothy or with your American relatives in De Golden and Medina, or whether you're making a religious pilgrimage, permanent or temporary, towards Yerushalayim, the journey of migration, the passage of mobility, requires an imagination of place, a topography of desire, a profound sense of where you're aiming for, an end point in all senses. You can't make a journey without a vision. And I want today to explore with you some of the texts that created this imagined topography. Is this on? Yeah. It's gone off. There we go. I want today to explore with you some of the texts that created this imagined topography and explore in particular how travelling becomes in itself a way of talking not just about a sense of place traversed, but a far broader notion of transformation. So I want to start right in with a text that was written by a Jew, probably in Alexandria in the Hellenistic period, of course, in honor of Marin, our Hellenistic Jewish maven, um, who's organized this conference, namely the Exegogy of Ezekiel. It's a tragedy written in Greek based on the book of Exodus. The play itself was probably written in the second century BCE, but I'm going to count it as a text of late antiquity today because of its continuing influence across the period we've been discussing. Indeed, the very way we know this text sums up something crucial about traveling texts, migratory texts, my title. It's the habit of the most traditional form of classics, and indeed some of the more trendy historical scholarship of a person like Franco Moretti, the texts are taken to have their significance, their impact, at the moment of their first production, rather than over time and changing over time. Reception studies are changing this habit, fortunately. And the exegogy shows why reception studies are crucial for looking at the culture of late antiquity. Let me explain what I mean. We know the exegogy partly because we have a few manuscript fragments from Oxyrhynchus from the 4th century CE which shows that Ezekiel was being read 500 years after his first outing. But more important, we know the exegogy because it is quoted. It's quoted first by Alexander Polyhister. Now, Polyhister was a Greek who was enslaved and brought to Rome, where his literary skills and voluminous knowledge were prized. And he's the first we know to have quoted Ezekiel at length in his book on the Jews. It's an incredibly interesting moment. A Greek has been transported as a slave to Rome, and amid bringing his Greek knowledge of culture to the Romans, he brings Judaism too, by virtue of a Hellenistic Jew whose text is a, is a testimony to the assimilated culture of the Alexandrian Jewish community, whereas Philo would put it, Greek and Hebrew run together like sisters. 
Polyhistor is, in other words, an icon of cultural transformation. But why do we have these fragments of polyhistor quoting Ezekiel? Because they come to us from pseudo-Eustathius. Now, pseudo-Eustathius is, Eustathius is the name given to a text we have in fully 26 manuscripts, which is a commentary on the Hexameron, the first six days of creation, as narrated in Genesis. It's probably a late 4th, early 5th century text, but there's still no modern translation, commentary, or edition, which is why most people don't know it. For Eustathius, as for polyhistor, the exagogy is good to think with in late antiquity. What's more, Ezekiel is also quoted by Clement of Alexandria, Clement, the Christian whose stromatase is the iconic text of rehabilitating pagan Greek learning into the Christian tradition, along with the Jewish Greeks like Philo. Clement is constantly seeking to find the flashing fragments of Christian truth in Greek writing from Homer down to his own day, allowing a place for paideia in Christianity that Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa are going to make central to the intellectual transformation of Christianity in late antiquity. But Ezekiel also appears quoted at length in Eusebius, the founding father of Christian historiography. That is, Ezekiel's text, which most of us, if we read it at all, read it packaged rather calmly in the excellent tradition of Howard Jacobson, comes to us actually thanks to a set of repackaging gestures by late antique Christians, from Clement to Pseudo-Eustathius, drawing on its already repackaged excerpts in the transported Greek of the intellectual slave Polyhistor. It's a text about travelling, the Exodus, that makes its own sets of travels and transformations through late antiquity, as Christian genealogical or supersessionist reading retells the tragedy as its own triumph. Ezekiel's status as a Jew has led to the usual treatment of Jewish authors by classicists. Nauk simply excluded him from the addition of fragments of Greek tragedy, don't count Jews. Ezekiel's poetry was regularly derided by 19th century scholars and their followers for not being classical. And when the exagogy has been celebrated, it's been because it's surprising to find a Jew writing Greek with a modern of skill, or more recently because it's like Hellenistic poetry. Well, that like, like Hellenistic poetry, betrays the inherited and unreflective slur. The exagogy is, simply enough, Hellenistic poetry. It's first of all a paradigm of Kreuzung der Gattungen, a hybridization of genres typical of Hellenistic literary culture. It's a prose text. Uh, it takes a prose text and transforms it into verse. It takes a historical narrative and turns it into a tragic drama. The exagogy is replete with echoes, not just of the Septuagint, but of a wide range of Greek writers. That is, it uses the arta alasiva characteristic of Hellenistic poetry, the intertextual playfulness endemic to the texture of late Greek literature. It even has a locus amoinus, the description of a pastoral haven typical of such poetry, that imagines the groves of Elim, where the Israelites camp. It's an ekphrasis with an easy symbolism of flowing water and growth of 12 trees to catch us something about the 12 tribes of Israel and the role of water in the narrative of desert wandering as an image of Torah study. The amazing recently discovered mosaics from the late antique uh, synagogue in Hukok, excavated by Jody Magnus, also have a huge image of the grove of Elim, complete with all the trees and the fountains. It ran down one whole side of the synagogue. It might seem surprising that Elim should be the focus of literature and art. It barely has a sentence in the Torah, and nothing happens there. But it had become the subject of interpretation and allegorical reading quite early. Hence its appearance as significant in both Ezekiel and Hukok. And since its adoption by Christian writers, who see the twelve trees now as the twelve disciples of Jesus, and the waters as the waters of the promised blissful eternal life of a Christian. So Ezekiel, simply a Hellenistic poet, there's a strong cultural project of locating the self through literature within a long tradition of Hellenism as a construction against life in the multicultural Egyptian community of Alexandria. And that's one of the things that makes it good for Christians to steal. But we can be more precise. 
Ezekiel's tragedy rewrites the Bible. And rewriting is what the Bible does and encourages. Commentary, translating, retelling are endemic and integral to the biblical tradition, whatever extremists talk about the unchanging word of God written in stone. The Septuagint, the most influential piece of Hellenistic prose, is a translation for the Jewish community in Alexandria, most of whom spoke no Hebrew, and it had already become the liturgical text of the community, as it was for the later Christians too. By turning this Greek translation into another form, the privileged genre of tragedy, Ezekiel is upping the stakes of interaction between Jews and Greeks in Alexandria. What's more, the story that he chooses from the Bible is the Exodus, the journey that makes the Israelites into a people, and the people the focus of the narrative after the single family of Abraham. The retranslated Greek text is about the transformation of a people. It's also the story of a traumatic journey. It's also the retelling of the story of the Passover. And in the tragedy, as in the book of Exodus, the narrative gives you explicitly an etiology for the rituals of the temple for Passover. Yet for the Alexandrians, away from the Holy Land, what is the possibility of such a ritual? Does the play take the place of ritual? A retelling that is the replacement of cult? Indeed, it can't be forgotten that the Exodus is precisely an Exodus from Egypt. And here is a play written in Egypt. <laughs> Indeed, the fragments we have open with Jacob leaving Canaan, it begins Lipon, which any Euripidean will know is the first word of many a Euripidean tragedy. And it's a journey back towards what he calls Idion Horon, our own land. The journey of national formation is narrated in Egypt as if it's not started. It's the literature of exile. If Callimachus and their pals were all too aware that they didn't live in Athens, but in the library in Africa, Ezekiel is all too aware that he lives in still what is the iconic land to leave. The tragedy, a transformation of literary tradition, is also an exploration of the cultural and religious tradition that Ezekiel inhabits as a Jew in Alexandria, still longing, still in Egypt. The tragedy of the traveling Israelites is precisely about the cultural journey that every Alexandrian Jew is making in their head, trying to find a place of cultural belonging. Tragedy, after all, is the genre to explore a sense of what cultural self and the strategies of belonging mean. But there's one other very specific reason why the exagogi attracted the attention of late antique Christians. The text we have ends with the Grove of Elim. And in the Grove of Elim, and this is not in the Torah, the Israelites see a marvellous paradox, the phoenix bird, the mystical bird which, according to Herodotus, dies on a pyre and then is reborn to fly off and is an immortal bird. It appears every 500 years. There is, of course, no phoenix in the Torah that I've been able to find. And scholars have seen Ezekiel's description of this miracle as both a typically Hellenistic love of paradoxical marvel of the animal kingdom and attempt also to link the story of the Jews back to the privileged status of Greek heritage. But for the Christians, there was a phoenix in the Torah. Could I have the slide up? Uh, Psalm 91 verse 13 reads, the just man will flourish like a palm tree, Sadik Ketamar. Right? Or in the Septuagint's Greek that you have in front of you, Dikaios hos phoenix anthese. The word phoenix, palm tree, perfect translation of Tamar, is the same word as phoenix, the phoenix bird. Christians read this verse as the just man will flourish like a phoenix, which they further understood as a symbol of resurrection. The phoenix bird came back after three days, they argued. It's a clear and wonderful precursor and symbol of Jesus' resurrection. And thus, every just man's promise of an eternal life. To have a version of the Exodus that ended with the phoenix gave them a story of the Exodus that ended with Christianity's promise. So why is Ezekiel's exegogy so wonderfully demonstrative of what I mean by migratory texts. Let me hazard six placeholding conclusions for now. First of all, this is a text about traveling. The Exodus is the tale of a journey to the Holy Land. Second, and this is specific but not unique to the Exegogi, 
It's an uncompleted journey which leaves open the fantasy of completion, the opportunity to recreate an endpoint for the journey's climax, a possibility especially telling for people still living in the archetypal place to leave. It allows for a topography of desire. Third, it's a story not just of travel, but of transformation, the coming to be of a people, the cultural transformation that's being told at a heightened moment of anxious transformation for the, the culture that is actually retelling this story namely the Jews in Alexandria arguing about their cultural identity as exiles and assimilationists in Greek and Egyptian environment, the two environments that always produced a great tension in Jewish self-definition, as the rabbis keep repeating, we know we're not Greek, we know we're not Egyptian. Okay? Retelling the Exodus, retelling it like this in Greek, in Egypt, provokes the question of cultural identity as a travelling, shifting, transformative capability. Fourth, the narrative is itself a transformation. That is, it is literally a metamorphosis of literary form, turning the Greek prose of the Septuagint, already a translation, into a verse drama. And transformation of form is part and parcel of the narrative of transformation. How is the story to be told now? That's the question. Fifth, it takes its narrative endpoint, not just as a symbol of transformation, but as a symbol of rebirth. The phoenix and grafts it into the narrative in the most brazen way. The shock of this aggressive addition to the expected narrative of the biblical story demands that we reflect on the history being told in terms of 500-year periods of return to life, of coming back, and what eternity means for a people. And sixth and finally, the text itself travels. Whatever you think about its initial production, and we have frankly no idea what the text was for, how it's performed or read or studied, the narrative of transformation, with its openness and self-consciousness markers of, markers of change, make it a resource for later stories of transformation. So it gets reused by Christians themselves obsessed with stories of transformation, personal, institutional, universal. And in particular, the opportunity to retell the narrative of how the nation of Israelites came into being, so that it ends with a Christian image of resurrection, was just too good an opportunity not to take up. And it becomes thus a supersessionist story of the transformation of Judaism into Christianity. And together I suggest these six strategies show how traveling texts become a particular resource for imaging and imagining the topography of desire on which pilgrimage, mobility, and migration depend. They are texts that are about transformation, that transform, that are for your transformation. Well, the exegogy never reaches the Holy Land. My second example comes from the far end of late antiquity, and it's also a tragedy based on scripture. There is, here is another story written outside the Holy Land, but imagines itself wholly inside the Holy Land. The Christus Patiens is a tragedy written in Greek verse, probably in the 11th century, in Byzantium. But it's always attributed directly and explicitly in the manuscripts to Gregory of Nazianzus from the 4th century. Two minutes of background will just help with my critical questions. Gregory of Nazianzus, a great hero of mine at the moment, Gregory of Nazianzus has left more Greek poetry than any other author in antiquity. It is today largely unread, both by classicists and by theologians, who all know it's bad poetry, mainly because they haven't read it, and there's been the usual dismissive comments from 19th century critics who don't like post-classical Greek anyway. But Gregory is a crucial figure in the transformation of Christianity, along with his Cappadocian friends and relatives. Gregory locates his cultural activity against two enemies. First, he writes against the Emperor Julian, who had passed laws to keep Christians out of traditional Greek education. Christians, too, insists Gregory, are fully part of Greek pagan tradition. Second, however, he's fighting an internal battle against Christians who despise education. The words he uses are dip to aim, paideia, they spit on education. They see such a tradition as exothen outside Christianity, something foreign, something treacherous and dangerous and keeping us from God. Well, like Basil, who wrote a treatise defending the study of Greek literature for Christians, Gregory defends the place of Greek in this intellectual tradition against the ascetics, who saw any poetry as a mere distraction. 
Indeed, Gregory even confesses that he writes poetry precisely to compete with the pagan tradition so they don't have dibs on high culture alone. And the Cappadocian fathers are crucial figures in the intellectualization of Christianity and its continuing intimate relationship with Greek culture in the long journey towards the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. It's a major moment in the cultural transformation of Christianity. So it should be no surprise that Gregory is the name that gets attached to the Euripidean drama that is the Christus Patiens as an attempt to tell the story of the Passion of Christ in the form of a Greek tragedy, with many lines appropriated in the style of a kento from particular plays and an obvious imitation of the level of plot from Euripides Bacchae. Well, Gregory of Nazianzus was a hero of the Byzantine Renaissance. His bones were ceremoniously transferred from Nazianzus to Byzantium in the 10th century. 16 of his sermons became fully part of liturgy and thus were read annually in Byzantine churches. His work has numerous commentaries and lexica and treatises dedicated to it. He was a saint to think with, a foundational figure for the Byzantine church's understanding of its own past and its sense of tradition. And once again, we can see that as tragedy travels, becomes migratory, it becomes, um, uh, it, the journey becomes a complex, mediated transition. Euripides and the authority of the genre are mediated through the iconic figure of the 4th century Christianity's battle against its own ascetic, anti-literary wing, just as the Byzantine church caught under the leadership of Manuel Comenos in what is also known as the Comenian Restoration, is rediscovering its own Greek pasts. Genres that had fallen into disuse were recovered, and it's in this context of cultural restoration that the Christus Patiens is placed. To perform the rebirth or continuity of Greek intellectual culture in 11th century Byzantium, Euripides becomes a portal to pretend to be Gregory who argued for a rebirth or continuation of Greek culture in the 5th century, 4th century at a critical juncture at the formation of Nicene Christianity. Again, we can be a bit more specific. Unlike Ezekiel's exegogy, the Christus Patiens also adopts a style similar to, to a kento popular in the 4th century. It uses lots of lines, wholly or take, partly taken from tragic drama. We're asked to watch the transformation of the language of tragedy into the discourse of Christianity. But what was tragedy then becomes a story of salvation. And recent critics of this particular Christian form have stressed how creative and powerful a tool of rewriting this is and what the cultural politics of appropriation are. The privileged genre of tragedy is being redraft, redrafted to retell the foundational story of the Christian Bible or indeed world history as Christians would have it. And the temporality of this work I find absolutely fascinating. In the 11th century, in the name of the 4th century, appropriates the language of the 5th century BCE right, to determine the always already of the post-Nicene Logos. We can see how tradition is being constructed and doing a job of work to mark out the universalizing discourse of Christianity, a double takeover of the Greek past. Well, the plot involves the journey to and from the cross and to and from the tomb. The travel, again, is an explicit theme of this work. So too is mourning. Uh, Mary is the heroine of this play, not Jesus. And the redraft of the gospel narrative not only dramatized transitions, but takes one of the key features of tragedy, mourning, and reframes it through this maternal focus into a Christian framework. Now, mourning comes with the promise of ascension, with the future of the afterlife, the Christian promise noticeably absent from Greek tragedy. George Steiner famously said, you cannot have a tragedy in Christianity because of the promise of salvation. Well, here is the attempt to create what George Steiner said was impossible. There is a, an inherent contrast between the pagan despair at the violence of suffering and the end of death and the Christian triumph over death that resurrection indicates. Tragedy could be called a genre of suffering and death. The Christian reappropriation of tragedy is uh, a recomposition of the discourse of suffering and death to its new religious agenda. The travel of Mary, first to the cross, then to the tomb of Jesus, articulates a transformational transition. 
Well, the whole play is presented in the manuscript as if it's a Byzantine edition of a classical 5th century play. That is, it has, a, uh, it has a prose beginning, which you can see the Greek there, it just says, this is Gregory's play about Jesus. And, um, and I translated voice into, and then it has a verse hypothesis, which is what you'd expect. These are all invented to go with the play that is an invention as if it were a, a, a manuscript, which reads like this. Since you've been listening to poems in a pious way and now want to hear pious things expressed poetically, listen in good spirit. Now I'm going to tell you the world's saving passion in Euripidean style. Cata Euripidean. The prologue insists on the moment of performance with its use of nun, now. It's the language of oral de uh, delivery. And it evokes a reader who has been reading classical literature in a pious way, who has now offered another religious pious story in poetical form, marked specifically as à la um, The scene is thus set as a sophisticated circle who are going to appreciate the difference between reading the heritage of Greek literature in a holy way and reading the holy story in a Greek way. It marks the transformation that the text is undertaking. It gives it a name, Catchy Ripidan, Alla Euripides. This leads to some quite extraordinarily strange moments. When, for example, Mary is given lines from Euripides Medea, it is very strange to have the mother of God quote the most famous infanticide in literature. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the transformation of tragic language if you like, it doesn't always work perfectly. The, the, frame is, uh, the frame of the tragedy ends at the end with another quite extraordinary claim. He says, as you, as you can see, we're gonna, this, is, this is true drama. This is not fiction at all you've been reading. This is the real thing. It's not been smeared with the dung of mythical nonsense. And since you're a scholar of pious, pious narratives, I could tell you lots of other things. And I could have done it like Lycophron. In the same style as Lycophron, if you wanted that. Well, this is pretty extraordinary, because, of course, Lycophron, a bit later, is someone who also turned Greek tragedy into verse through, with Cassandra. And he's a pretty difficult person to understand, but we have from Byzantine, from this same period, two paraphrases of Lycophron. So he's another hot author for this period. Framing the story of the transformational journeys of the trusting women and the evil Romans and the Jews to and from the cross of Jesus is a story marked as transforming the world and man's place in it. And these paratexts make sure you're constantly aware that this is a transformation of the genre of tragedy. This is the self-reflexivity of migratory texts at work. So my general point about this is a very simple one. How then is Jerusalem imagined? It's imagined not only as a site defined by the mobility of women's movement around the fixed point of transformation, the tomb of Jesus, but is also imagined through the literary texture of transformation, as Euripides and Lycophron are transformed through an impersonation of Gregory of Nazianzus to become a retelling of the passion now for that culturally transformative moment of the Byzantine Renaissance. The reader, expressly addressed, is encouraged to see herself in a network of historical culture, which nonetheless tells the one story of the Passion. To travel to and around Jerusalem in the story is to travel to the... <laughs> is to travel <laughs> to the 5th century BC and back through the 4th century CE while staying in Byzantium. It's a sort of you know, video version of pilgrimage, literary video version of pilgrimage. Right? So if you, arrive in, if you do arrive in Jerusalem, then your vision has been prepared by this historical, cultural, theological perspective on space. It's a text to give you the imagination of pilgrimage. As Gregory of Nyssa wrote, how can you travel through places full of passion without passion? Right? It's both an emotional and an intellectual formation of a response to places that texts like Christus Patiens construct. Well, whoever wrote the Christus Patiens was drawing on a very long tradition, trying to inform the imagination of the pilgrim, both the pilgrim who travels and the pilgrim who does not. Well, Jerome, who we heard about yesterday, captures both sides of this. On the one hand, Jerome advises Paulinus of Nola not to go on pilgrimage. He should earnestly avoid leaving his ascetic life for the open road, even and especially to go to Jerusalem. God is everywhere, Jerome declares, 
and travel is thus a misprision of religious duty and understanding. The true temple of Christ is the believer's soul, he proclaims. So stay home and just imagine the scene of the Passion. But when he writes to Marcella, he sends a long letter describing pilgrimage to sacred sites, and he uses scripture to justify the practice of travel, starting with Lech Lecha, with God's instruction to Abraham. Get out of your country, he says. He lists the sites you should see, starting with Golgotha, where tradition holds that Adam, the first man, is buried. He even analyzes and dismisses the standard arguments against pilgrimage that he himself had just marshaled to Paulinus of Nola. Pilgrimage should be seen, he says, as the image of the soul rising from its alienation in the physical world to the spiritual city of God. It is an itinerarium animae, a journey of the soul, a phrase that could stand as an epigraph to my paper. With increasing intensity, Jerome insists that they will see not just places, but the very events of those places. We will see Lazarus come forth bound in grave clothes, he announces. We shall look on the waters of the Jordan purified for the washing of our Lord. We shall see the prophet Amos upon his crag blowing his shepherd's horn. Well, religious vision brings the past into the present. And so Paula, with whom Jerusalem did travel to Jerusalem, is told, you can behold with the eye of faith the infant Lord, wrapped in swaddling clothes and crying in the manger. To be in the place of revelation is to be in the time of revelation. Religious uh, travel for Jerome becomes a way of traveling in time, of constructing the eternal always already of Christian temporality. Jerome provides a template for Christian pilgrimage, justified by scripture not just to experience the sights but to re-experience the pathos of the sights and to recall them in song and tears and prayers as an image of Christian life, necessarily as an alienated journey, whereas Augustine explores in the city of God, humans are always foreigners, indigents, migrants in the physical world because you can only be truly at home in the city of God. Jerome writes to define the boundaries and possibilities of the Christian imagination as religious vision. And for him, as for Augustine, travel becomes a key discourse to express the necessary alienation, searching, and pain of Christian life on earth. When Gregory of Nyssa did write, how can you travel through the places of passion without passion? He's not suggesting you should just like up your emotional reaction to a tourist site, right? As if you're some sort of trauma tourist. Right? He's promoting a theologically informed topography of desire. If viewing is always an ideologically laden activity, Christian viewing through travel becomes a deeply theologically laden event which changes how landscapes and human engagement with landscape can be understood and experienced. Christians really want to change how you look at the world you are passing through. And Gregory of Nazianzus is a really interesting guide to this topography of religion. Not least because he writes such an interesting mix of church politics, personal narrative, and cultured exploration of the interrelation of theology with traditional Greek learning. He's going to add, too, to our picture of the theology of travel. He was born in his family's estate, near Nazianzus in southwest Cappadocia. Gregory made the usual grand tour as a, of education. As a young man, he went first to Caesarea. Then Alexandria, finally Athens, where he met Basil, who came from Caesarea, a different Caesarea, and Julian, who would become emperor and fierce opponent of Christianity. In traveling the empire like this, Gregory was following many a young man in search of an education, and he duly studied philosophy, rhetoric, and other subjects of the Encocleos Paideia, while joining a network of similarly rich and educated figures. Notice he doesn't go to Jerusalem. It's not inevitable that Jerusalem is the center of pilgrimage. If you're an intelligent Greek who's also Christian, you need to go to Athens first, get a, get a training. Right? As he became engaged, somewhat against his will, in the hierarchies of the church, 
He was asked by his friend Basil to take up a bishopric in Sassima, south of Nazianzus. Well, Gregory was deeply unimpressed by this prospect. He describes it as follows. It's utterly dreadful, he says. A pokey little hole, a paltry one-horse stop on the main road, devoid of water, vegetation, or the company of gentlemen. Nothing but dust, noise, chariots, cries, groans, instruments of torture. This was my church at Sassima. His autobiography, autobiography repeatedly imagines himself as suffering in the imitation of Christ, but Sassima seems to have been a step too far in humiliation. Um, he does a runner quite quickly. But later, in a position more suited to his amour propre, things are not much better. He goes to Constantinople as, uh, as bishop, the top religious position in the empire, you might think, but he's quickly outsmarted by the politicians of the church and ends up fleeing back to Nazianzus. Constantinople, for him, is a bowl full of scorpions. The picture of political life in the church of the fourth century is really vividly drawn against the material culture of empire. He travels around the empire, around Cappadocia, making a career among much bitterness, anger, and failure, which he describes in his long, self-serving autobiographical poems. He should really be the patron saint of academics. Um, yet there is a, a, another crucial strand to Gregory's work, which more justifies why he's known as the theologian in the 11th century. I mean, the theologian. He's known as the Holocaust. Take, for example, his apparata, his ineffable matters. It's a carefully ordered collection of eight poems on theology, on creation, the spirit, the sun, and so forth. And in this collection, we have a view of the cosmos as God's creation, of man as lured but limited by physicality. Humans are, he says, fat, dense, material creatures bound to the soil. What they must constantly seek is to raise themselves above such bonds and seek for God's grace. The cosmos is ordered and regular like the stars and the heavenly bodies. But, says Gregory in a line of stunning simplicity and directness, this is my story, no stars, self-driven. There is a tension that underlies the religious life of the 4th and 5th century, which, if you'll allow an oversimplification, Hartman will, for clarity's sake, it's a tension that sees travel, on the one hand, as a sign of the educated man, getting his education, rising in power through different positions in the church, articulating the reach of empire through the journey of a career in church, the adventure of life's journeys. On the other hand, such travel is a sign of the ambitious material world, a challenge to true spirituality which does not move, but in imitation of the cosmos is aimed at fixity, regularity, a denial of the material in the name of the spiritual, embodied not just in the stylite, but in the anchorite, or the monk who stays in his cell, or on top of a pillar, or in a cave, an icon of the unnecessary lure of culture or education. You can travel to see the stylite or the anchorite, but they remain unmoving and unmoved, an icon of mortified flesh, till, as we're reminded, they step down. To understand travel in the Christian empire of late antiquity and the texts that describe travel and create its understanding, this tension between travel as a story, an adventure, a career, and travel as a failure of turning your face towards God is, I think, a fundamental matrix. In short, you can't understand travel without knowing to what it is opposed. The final text I want to discuss will take us back to where I began <coughs> with the Exegogi, because it was most likely a Hellenistic Jewish text that gets taken up by Christian readers and translators. And it will add one final note to how texts become travelling texts in the sense I've been exploring. And this text is a novella known as Joseph and Asenet. Osnot. Uh, I can't do the modern Hebrew correctly. One of the many extraordinary things about this prose story is that nobody wants it. It plays almost no role in the history of Judaism, although it probably started life as a text from within the community of Alexandrian Hellenistic Judaism. It plays almost no role in the history of Christianity, although it was translated into seven other languages and used by Christian communities from Ethiopia to Romania to Syria for hundreds of years. As testimony of how little this text is wanting, wanted, it's striking that Joseph and Asenet contains 
the longest scene, or probably the longest scene of religious conversion from antiquity. Yet it plays no role at all in Arthur Darby Knox's comprehensive, much-praised book, Conversion. Nor does it appear in the voluminous discussions of conversion in ancient Judaism from Shia Cohen on. Yet the very reasons why nobody wants this text in modern scholarship are the reasons why I think it had the impact it did in antiquity. Joseph and Asenet has a very familiar midrashic structure. That is, it finds two holes in the story, or questions, if you prefer, two questions of the story of Joseph from the Bible, and fills them in with imaginary storytelling. So the first question is, how did Joseph, as a key figure in the genealogy of Judaism, get to marry an Egyptian princess, and what's more, the daughter of a, of a, of a, of a priest? Uh, you'll remember the text says no more than Joseph married Asenet, the daughter of the Egyptian priest Potipharon, and that they had two children. Second question, if Joseph was so powerful, how come there's no continuity of Jewish power in Egypt? Well, it went wrong. The first, uh, the first half of the novel answers the first question by depicting Asenet as a woman committed to purity, who, because she falls in love with Joseph, converts to worshipping the one God, and that solves the problem of Joseph's marriage. She's converted. The second half of the novel is taken up with a set of battle narratives and political shenanigans after which Joseph agrees to hand back power to, to Pharaoh's son, and that explains the second problem. The scene of jo Asenet's conversion has vexed and fascinated readers. She is, of course, a woman. On her own, she throws away the food of idols to strange dogs outside her window. She discards her fine clothes, her religious objects, and she fasts for seven days and prays. And the prayer is answered by an angel who comes down and tells her that her prayers have been accepted by God and that metanoia, conversion, sits by the right hand of God and she will sit there too and she can convert. The scene gives us a remarkable access to the woman's subjectivity through her long prayers, desperately seeking internal change. Modern Jews don't want this text because there's no rabbinical authority, no agreed ritual, and because an angel comes down to talk to a woman. Modern Christians don't want it because there's no mention of Jesus. She converts not for chastity, but to marry and have children and sex, and there are no priests or catechism. And worse of all, it seems to be a Jewish text of spirituality rather than law and neither religion likes it when a woman does it for herself and is then authorised by God in so doing. Yet I'd like to suggest that this strange and unparalleled scene of conversion is exactly what allows this text to circulate through so many communities. Because the ritual it describes has no equivalent in any religious community where it goes, it opens a space of possibility, a space, if you like, of the imagination, Imagination of transformation. And thus it can be taken up and reused by multiple communities. There are here multiple levels of transformation. The story retells a biblical paradigm. It turns Genesis into a new form, a novel or a Megillah. It's a story that in Greek circulates in two versions, a long one or a short one, which are transformations of each other. Nobody knows which came first. It becomes translated or changed in translation into seven languages. It becomes a Christian text, or at least it's read widely in Christian communities, thereby transformed in religious purchase. And yet, most tellingly, these transformations are all centered around the central <coughs> transformation of Asenet from a pagan into a monotheist, from a girl who despises men into a married woman with children, and from a silent, uncharacterized figure to the central character of a story. The story travels because it's about a conversion in an era where conversion has become a central political and religious issue, in late antiquity, that is. And this strange depiction of a conversion, which is not like the conversions of religious cult, becomes a tale to imagine the idea of transformation itself. In depicting her long prayers, it allows a sense of the subjectivity of transformation, something we get in very few versions outside Babs or Gustin. And as this text moves between communities and languages, it represents a character moving from her community into a new one through religious change. Well, historians usually like their texts fixed in place. So this text gets disowned doubly, but its very potential for talking about transformation lets it travel significantly. 
What I think I've shown you this evening is a set of texts. I could have added more, but there's Greek and Latin, prose and verse, written by major figures in church history and anonymous unknowns. What they have in common, first of all, is that they were all once very widely read and circulated and are now barely known. They have very, ex they have very little explicit high-level theology in them, which is why theologians are largely uninterested. They have very little in them that historians would regard as grown-up history, which is why historians have largely ignored them. But what they show is how travel becomes a model for transformation, and transformation becomes a model for travel. The transformation of literary form, translation between languages or between registers of the same language, the rewriting of scripture, transmission across communities and time, are all signs of what I mean by traveling texts, migratory texts. In an era when Christianity made personal and cultural transformation a dominant mode of being, these texts show not just how the discourse of travel is mobilized in late antiquity, but how Christians want to change the very way you move through the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goldhill, for this inspiring talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, well, can I begin? Of course. Uh, it strike, strikes me that you uh, somehow neglected the, uh, the fact that the same model exists in, in the uh, Neoplatonists. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, uh, Porphyry with his interpretation of the travels of uh, Odysseus as uh, yep. uh, spiritual sure. transformation uh, towards yep. the salvation of the soul. Mm -hmm. You're, you're absolutely right, though, uh, to be fair, there are dozens of texts that I ignored, uh, many of which are relevant to the paper I've been, been arguing about. So you're absolutely right that Porphyry will re take on uh, Homer in that way. will also, of course, construct a model of transition between different levels of being as a model of transformation and as a model of travel through time, as an as expression of time. And it's fascinating to me that when you get to certain Christians, uh, just been studying Sinesius' hymns, and in many of those hymns, I would say of the nine hymns, only one can be distinctly marked out as Christian. The other eight, you have a real problem saying is it Christian or Neoplatonic. Yes, uh, so my point was that it is uh, not exclusively Christian. No, 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 no. Well, I, I started with the, I mean, I started with the Exegoki of Ezekiel as saying yeah. that's already got these things in it. And I think what happens is it becomes a specifically important Christian model. Once transformation yes. and conversion becomes such a dominant theme of cultural belonging, mm -hmm. and it starts clearly in the Hellenistic period when people are deracinated in different ways from dominant Greek culture, moving to Africa, living in Alexandria, and particularly with the Jewish community there is struggling what their cultural identity is, and that's when we start to see these stories and why they get picked up. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's not only a Christian issue, nor should it be seen as one, nor is pilgrimage, nor is travel. But <laughs> obviously, for the purposes of the late antique and this particular conference, I wanted to emphasize on that because conversion is so important. And then why does, why do it, yeah, if you like, what is the Venn diagram that puts together conversion on the one hand, travel on the other, and, you know, the literary past in the third okay, section. Fair enough. My own. I think you heard it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Simon. Yeah. Um, um, can, can I get you to compare um, the Exagoge and Joseph and Azenith? Um, because I completely agree with you, despite some recent mm. interpretations, that Joseph and, and Azenith is essentially a, is a, a Jewish Greek um, yeah. uh, text. Um, that mm -hmm. has only later been kind of Christianized. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have been intrigued where to, where to place it. I mean, in the, the, novel, the novel type in some ways may even suggest perhaps a rather late date. Mm -hmm. and, um, sure. and I'm then no longer sure whether it really comes from Alexandria. Uh, but in any case, yeah. I, I mm -hmm. you know, taking your analysis, mm -hmm. and you kind of came from the Exagoge through the Christian text and back to uh, Joseph and Zenit. So I just, Thank yeah, you. so yeah. whether you can kind of compare these, the beginning yep. and the end of your yeah. lecture. Thank and, you, and, yes. And, and, and do, do you see them as kind of yeah. going in a different direction sure. or using 
kind of... No, but I think you, you caught... Thank you. You underlined something of the structure of the paper that was designed mm -hmm. to start and end in the Jewish text of Alexandria, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. framing them in that way, precisely because uh, one of the things that's so interesting about those texts is that, as you say, I think they are almost certainly start their life it, as Jewish texts in Alexandria. And we'll come back to what they were for in that period, but they were there. What's so fascinating is that they are then picked up by Christians and read, but unlike so many other texts we have, they are not Christianized. That is to say, you have no introduction of the word Jesus, you have no introduction of the promise of Jesus, and we have so many examples in later texts, the Sibylline Oracles being the most obvious one, where when you want to change it, you just bang in a load of Jesus stuff, and that will turn your, your text into something Christian, and you can redesign it, and then we have a different sort of argument. So I was... Yeah, I no, on a textual level. On a textual level, I was just going to say... Well, well, on a social level, what I find interesting is there, there are two sides to that social level. I mean, the one is what happens in Alexandria, the other is later. I'll start with the later and move back. What I think is interesting is what is it in those texts that allows them to become Christian without a transformation of Christian vocabulary? And for me, it's about travel. It's about the stories of transformation that then become a resource for thinking through a particular idea, set of ideas. So all you have to do is re-understand the word phoenix, and you can do the whole this is a Christian text. When we go back to what's going on in, in Hellenistic Judaism, I, you know, I, I think we probably ag agree on this, at least I hope we agree on this, that it's something deeply ununderstood, that we just don't know about all sorts of elements of cultic behavior and response. So I chose two texts for which that is a particularly strong version. So on the one hand, we have a tragedy, but we have no idea, was it performed? Was it acted out? Was it something we did? Was it a, a Purim spiel? Or was it, I, you know, it could be, you could imagine all sorts of possibilities for it. At the same time, with Joseph and Asenet, you could imagine it as a Megillah. It's not dissimilar from Esther. In the sense that you have a book, you could tell the story, you could imagine it on an occasion in which it was used. It could have been used in a, in a synagogue. It could have been something you read on a Shabbos afternoon or in a school. Or it could have been, as 19th century people would say, oh, it must have been a text for women at best who could have read the side. You know, the usual story. So the point is that all of those are potential readings, but we have no idea what it was used for. And that sort of gap in our knowledge is, is to me, fascinating about how we understand <laughs> Hellenistic Judaism, which is a long way from my, from my greater text and, and late an antiquity. But I think it's fascinating to see what, the, what Jewish texts the Christians picked up. So, of course, the Septuagint, but also these texts become, you know, a big moment. There are a lot of manuscripts of these things. So. Was Christus Paschal performed? Again, we, don't, we have no idea whatsoever. It, the framing of it suggests not, because we're given it as if it were a manuscript. And that's undoubtedly, I mean, the texts are written in one form. So it's as if we're, we're accessing a reading group, is the Gregory of Nancy, uh, uh, in, yeah. that, in that form. So, you know, who knows? But, uh, Thank you for a really very enjoyable uh, listening experience. Yes. I just wanted to ask whether you have any thoughts about uh, whether um, uh, apocryphal um, acts of the apostles fit into, into this matrix in any way. Uh, texts very much about traveling. I'm thinking particularly about the Acts of Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, but a, tra a different kind of traveling, traveling with a very specific goal mm -hmm. um, and oriented, uh, you know, f very much framed in a specific uh, narrative about the apostolic mission. Sure. Um, I, think that's a, I, mean, I think that's a really helpful question for two reasons. First, because it puts the emphasis on how much of a certain sort of Christian literature is about travel, but about travel that is designed to be a story of transformation of where you go to and who you are. And that, to me, is a very important part of the texts of how we understand then pilgrimage and migration. So in one of the papers today, we were, we were given a list of the texts we might have to get the internal experience of, or the experience of pilgrims, and it was listed. But this sort of imaginative literature doesn't get in there quite so much, and I think it should, because I think it's forming the imagination of, of, of Christians. And you can see these texts multiplying, which is why they are, <laughs> which is why they are as, as it were, not, not, in, not, in the, not in the canon. But the other side of it is, I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, the other side of it is the question of 
um, the change of perspective. If you like, the text, I mean, where here, because it's an apostolic succession and apostolic work, we're doing two things. First of all, we're changing the positionality. So that the travel story is about the person trying to do the transformation, not the transformed. And that's an important, different perspective on what I've been talking about. But also, of course, as soon as you say apostolic succession, for me, it's also about the construction of tradition of change, of how do we get to where we are, and the stories of the past. And that, what I was describing as supersessionism, could have been described as the creation of tradition or of succession, if you like. So succession rather than supersession might have been a politer term to have used. Um, and I think that's a very important part of what's happening with a, a, a new religion, is it's an attempt to construct itself as always already there. And so, you know, we were talking about Chalcedon and Nicaea before, with the idea that the Son and the Father are co-temporaneous, co <laughs> the idea that there was, all, there was no beginning. Right? There was no beginning, it's always already there. And if there is a beginning, we don't know quite how to tell it. Um, for me, that sort of temporal moment is summarized by Nonus in the fifth century who does a paraphrase of the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John begins, of course, in, in our care, and Logos. And the first word of John's, of, of Nonus's paraphrase of John is Akronos, timeless. So he says, instead of the word beginning, we start with the word timeless, which is saying, no, we've got to rethink the time of, of, of religion. There is no beginning in the same way. And so, not only beginning, but no gaps. So, where I'm heading towards is a rather long-winded answer is towards Eusebius's construction of historiography precisely through not just apostolic but episcopal succession and uh, bishops uh, uh, succession. So the desire of historiography to construct succession in Christianity, which of course then becomes a huge row in the Renaissance and the Reformation between Christianity and Catholics and Protestants uh, replaying that row. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll, just, I'll just add that... Uh, hmm. The hymn of the pearl that is set into the mm. Acts of Thomas, which seems to be yeah. a, a, a distinct text and probably mm. quite an old one, right? Uh, Interesting. Has uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day? It has essentially it is a text about travel, mm -hmm. uh, also, and it is it has essentially the same story as the tale of Sinuhe. As of the tale of Sinuhe, the, the very old Egyptian. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Which, uh, why, I have no idea, but... Uh, no, no, but, I, I, uh, I, I have no comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Safely. Thank you very much.